Well, uh, shipping will, will always be there. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gothberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners. Welcome to the 111th episode of the Shipping Podcast, where you will be meeting Per Westling, Managing Director for Stena Roro. And listen to how he views the shipping industry and how passionate he is about his job. Before we start, I have a confession to make. This interview was made twice. For the first time, and there is always a first time for everything, I messed up with the interview and deleted the interview when I was going to edit it. I found out the hard way that it was impossible to recover the audio file. So after a few bad words, bad language, I had to go back to Per and ask him to meet with me again. He was a good sport and he gave me a new chance to do it again. I'm saying this also so that you know that in this interview, it's Per who has all the technical knowledge. We made this interview in the headquarters of Stena on April the 2nd, 2019. And if you haven't listened to the episode 110, the prior one, with Thomas Fransson, who is the National Director for Mercy Ships in Sweden, you might want to do that after you have listened to how Stena Ruru is building the world's largest hospital ship. I hope you enjoy listening to Per as much as I did. Here is Per Westling for you. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Thank you. I'm uh, Per Westling. I'm the uh, Managing Director of Stina Roro, Gothenburg, Sweden. And what is your background? My background is uh, within uh, naval architecture. So that's uh, where I started. I also had a short spell in the uh, Swedish Navy doing marine engineering, uh, diving and, and other things. And uh, uh, after that, I actually came to, to Stena, where I have spent my, my days after that and um, doing um, quite a few different things within the company. Such as? First, as a young uh, naval architect, uh, working with new buildings and uh, theoretical work in, uh, within our technical department. Uh, then quite early, actually moving on to the Roro division. Uh, working with conversions and then also new building. And after that, to Stena Line, to the operation uh, within Stena Line, ship management, uh, working there for five years. Uh, among other things, uh, that was a time when we had the Y2K challenge. So now you have uh, sort of revealed your age. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in a way. <laughs> so that was a very interesting part of my Maybe career. Maybe you should develop you like. what is that? For the young listeners. Uh, Y2K. Yeah. Yeah, that was when we changed over to the year 2000, when uh, when we we had some, in some ways, afraid that there would be some total disaster with all the electronic systems, all the computers and everything. But uh, it was not so bad. And there was some preparations done, of course, but it, but it ruined uh, New Year's Eve and a New Year's Day for some people uh, that <laughs> year. <laughs> so. And we survived. We survived, the the world survived, also the Y2K yeah. thing, yes. So I understand that Stena is a group of companies? That's right, that's right. Well, you can say that within shipping, uh, we have a few different segments. It's uh, the ferries, uh, it's the tankers, it's um, the Stena Roro, the Roros and, and, the, and the passenger ships that we have, which is slightly different to the Stena line uh, setup. And in addition to that, we have also ship management. And then we have drilling, uh, offshore drilling activity as well, which is slightly separated, at least geographically, where it's uh, situated in, in Aberdeen. And Stena Roro is based here in Gothenburg. Yes, that's right. So what do you do at Stena Roro? Now I'm the managing director. That is since uh, 2011. And before that, I was a deputy, but working mainly um, with um, large conversions and uh, new buildings as well of, 
of Roro ships and uh, rope packs uh, ships. And we do uh, um, a lot of different things, actually, uh, ranging from uh, being uh, brokers, both for external business, uh, but also for, for internal business, being a kind of house broker, if you like, for, for the, our ferry company, Stena Line. Uh, so that is one very important part of what we do. But so ranging from that and over to um, contract management, charter parties and uh, commercial operation, technical operation and uh, conversions of ships and uh, new building of ships. So we basically, we can take care of a process in, for example, buying a ship or chartering a ship, converting it, maybe shortering it, hit it out to, uh, to another party or, or uh, for that matter, an internal party as well. And at the other end, and uh, as I mentioned, a new building. So we develop new buildings for both for Stena Line requirements and also for uh, external companies uh, that are willing to, to make business with us and to, uh, in many cases, then long-term charter ships uh, from us that we have been building. I understand that you have a new building program. Can we talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, of course. We uh, well, we have um, been quite active in the new building in the last couple of years, uh, but it started already much earlier. Actually, uh, in the sense that we we really felt that we need to look at uh, alternative ways of building our ferries, more cost effective, and um, and so on. So, so we we started to look at uh, China. Uh, of course, we also looked at uh, Korea. India, Vietnam, and, and uh, other countries that has some chip building. But uh, we came more and more interested actually in, in China as a supplier of ships for, for the future. And um, that was a long, long way to go and uh, a lot of visits and a lot of uh, inspections, sub suppliers and so on to make sure that the quality and standard of what they do is, is according to our requirements. But we managed to place an order with the Chinese shipyard and um, that was done in 2016. And um, at the moment we have nine ships uh, on order from that particular shipyard. So who are, are you building for Stena or are you building for other external parties? Or? Uh, five of those ships are for Stena and four for, uh, for external clients that uh, will then airboat charter these ships from us. Okay. The shipbuilding industry has changed in a way because you used to build ferries and rope axes in Scandinavia mm. or Europe before. Yeah, that's right. And and this is this is really what what we felt that uh, it is going to be more and more difficult to build uh, in Europe. We have to compete, if you like, with the, with the cruise ships and the more complex ships that still are being built in Europe. And that means that the prices uh, will go up. And uh, at the other end, uh, the, the, the standard and, uh, and the quality of, of what is being done in, in Asia is increasing more and more. Uh, so therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's quite natural, I think, for us to, to have a look and see what can be what can actually be uh, achieved in uh, when it comes to shipbuilding in, in uh, of this type of ships in, in Asia. So I had the pleasure of meeting uh, with Thomas Svensson, who is with Mercy Ships mm-hmm. in Sweden, and he mentioned that you are building the new building for Mercy ships. That's right. We are we are also doing that, in fact. And and uh, that's not our own ship. That is something we do um, as a service to uh, to Mercy ships. And in fact, that project started already a few years before we placed our larger series of, of Ropax vessels. So we placed that order uh, back in 2013 uh, with the shipyard there. And um, yeah, it's a very interesting project, but very different from what we normally do, I must say. It's, it's a hospital ship and it's the first of, of its kind, definitely. And it's also going to be the biggest ship, the biggest civilian hospital ship uh, ever built. So what is the difference? Could you please describe that? Well, there are there are some, some clear differences, obviously, uh, but there are also some similarities, in fact. So, so sometimes, uh, you know, we say that uh, it's actually, it is like a big passenger ship. Uh, we have a, a lot of public spaces and a lot of cabins and uh, other things that are very similar to to that of a, of a passenger ship today. And it means that uh, the standard and the quality of cabins and other public spaces and so on needs to be the same. And and therefore it was very, very good for us to actually 
to, to start to learn the, the, the Chinese sub suppliers uh, on, on that project, which we gained um, we gained a lot of experience that we then could have have made use of for our Ropex project. But obviously, no cargo on board, so there is uh, instead there is a very big hospital, uh, six hospital rooms or. Uh, the better word is probably uh, surgery room or operation theater, as they call it sometimes. It means that you can have six uh, surgeries going on uh, simultaneously on that ship. And uh, there is time pl- place for, for more than 1,000 people on board. And so when she is in port, which is then about 10 to 11 months uh, every year. So what, uh, what comes to my mind is the power supply, because you can't get sort of power mm. you need the power through the entire operation <laughs> that's right that's right it's a, this is a diesel electric uh, arrangement so we have um, a number of diesel generators and uh, since the ship is only moving maybe one month uh, a year we use the same engines for propulsion as for uh, for uh, for power generation uh, they're very very specially uh mounted equipment so there's no vibrations and so on and then you can imagine if you're doing a very advanced surgery you don't want uh, the whole surgery room to to vibrate as you can do sometimes on a ferry so so everything is extremely well designed and and built uh, to 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 make it stable so what fuel is she on she can operate on different fuels but it's a conventional fuel so heavy fuel oil or or, or gas oil hmm And uh, who will be managing it? That is the uh, Mercy Ships Foundation themselves. So they have um, they have today an operation of one hospital ship, and it's all taken care of by by their own organization, which is uh, situated in uh, in the U.S. in Texas. And the name of the ship, I understand, will be Global Mercy. <laughs> Global Mercy. That's right. When will she be delivered? She will be delivered next year. We think uh, the first half of next year, and then she will go straight to Africa to start uh, start working in parallel with uh, with the existing ship. Hmm. So I understand you have been to the current ship. You, you yes. visited the ship that is now in. Yes, I have. In fact, yes, I have spent uh, one week in uh, Madagascar on the on the Africa Mercy, which was a very very interesting experience. I must say, also very different from what we normally do. <laughs> so the people working for Stena Line could actually sign up and, and be volunteers for most of the ships. Yes, that's right. There is a, there is quite a, a large um, system now uh, being in place whereby the employees of Stena can, uh, can actually go down to the ship. The company will assist them in some ways uh, with some of the costs, but but in principle they have to be as, as everybody else uh, in uh, that ship, uh, namely volunteers, and they have to pay a monthly fee for for food and and housing and so on and then work with different things on board uh, everything from from uh, deck and engine work uh, to to catering services to cleaning to other things that that is possible there is a lot of of need for for different uh, categories of people on board that ship and they have also taken it to the ferries i understand because some of some of the money that is paid by your passengers on board goes to the mercy ship foundation or absolutely uh, we have a we have a cooperation with mercy ships that is is uh, is really very very good and uh, for example you had the opportunity to pay a little extra for your cup of coffee and uh, the difference went uh, straight to to mercy ships so what are the biggest differences that you have seen during your time in the maritime industry you've been around for a while now sorry to say that but <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. <laughs> I think there has been two major things in my in my way of looking at it, and and one is definitely the safety issue, where we have had uh, some tremendous improvements of uh, safety on board the, the ships. You know, we had uh, accidents like Herald of Free Enterprise, for example, in the in the eighties, and uh, that changed entirely the uh, the damage stability regulation for for the ships and. Uh, We've had other terrible accidents uh, involving fire, and uh, that has uh, made it really necessary to uh, improve uh, fire safety as well. Uh, I really think that there has been a tremendous improvement in in, the, in those areas when it comes to, to safety. 
which is of course absolutely necessary for, for our industry to, to survive. And the next thing is the environmental challenges, of course, that, that, that we have and that is uh, now being focused on a lot. And, and it will continue, of course, for in the future as well. And the latest things are the CO2 matters that, that of course, has a full focus now. And, and uh, I really do think that it was a positive um, decision taken by, by IMO to, to, to set up uh, a goal whereby we reduce the CO2 emissions 2050 with, uh, with 50%. That is a very, very important signal that is given by IMO and it, it, it's, it, it kickstarts uh, everybody in the business, I think, to actually start uh, this development, which is, uh, which is uh, so, so important and so necessary. Yeah, I see so many interesting inventions nowadays. I mean, everyone is yeah. thinking about yeah. alternative fuels and, and all of that. And what yeah. is your view? What, what is the next thing coming? Because now... You, Stena Line is working with methanol. You have the batteries. Uh, talking yeah. about that. Yeah. What do you think? Hydrogen or I don't know. Well, if, if we only had the answer, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it is extremely difficult to to say. Of course, the only thing we know is that uh, we do not have the solution ready uh, as per now. But, but there are a number of different interesting parts which we can we ex- uh, we can explore, and um, hydrogen. Fuel cells, uh, absolutely. That that is one. It is scalable and and uh, can be increased. Uh, I think uh, definitely. Wind, solar energy, perhaps mainly. I would think those technologies should be used to produce uh, fuel in a more chemical way. So go away from the fossil based fuels, of course, which would be the fu- the normal fuel and uh, and the LNG and so on. So uh, in Stena, we we have focused on methanol, which is a, a clean and very good fuel. Uh, however, today, like basically all the fuels we have, it is fossil based. It can be produced from different things, but but the main pr- produce today would be uh, from uh, nat- natural gas, and uh, that we have to get away from, of course. But the the, the interesting thing with with methanol is that it can be produced in, uh, as I said, many different ways. One is actually to make use of CO2 and by CO2 and uh, water and uh, adding some, some energy, which then of course can be from, from solar energy or, or from wind energy. We can produce chemical uh, methanol and that can then be burnt in, in, in a regular uh, combustion engine, just like we are doing on the Stena Germanica in our fleet. So here we see a, a fuel that is uh, CO2 to neutral, maybe even if we make use of, of captured CO2, that means we are we're collecting CO2 from, from, the, from the atmosphere or from, from industries, uh, we can actually consume even more CO2 than, than what we are, so to say, emitting. So uh, it, can be, uh, it can be some, some really interesting technology there and uh, we just have to continue to develop and and uh, one day i think also the the uh, financial incentives will be with there so that we can we can switch over to a fossil free co2 neutral uh, but it will take time how do you see the future in general for the shipping industry well uh, shipping will will always be there of course and with a truly global uh, industry and uh, yeah, that will continue i'm sure people uh, people want to travel uh, go with the ferries with the cruise ships and 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 the goods needs to be traveled around the world of course so 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 we just have to uh, solve these things and uh, it needs to be done fairly fairly soon as well mm. my soapbox is that uh, the shipping industry is not visible enough so we don't get the attention we deserve what do you think about that And how can we do mm. something about it? One of the problems there I, I can imagine is that shipping is so big and so wide. So it's everything from from bulk uh, carriers um, doing uh, a lot of, let's say, hard, rough work, if that is the right word, I don't know, in, in parts of the world, which we never see actually, and uh, polluting a lot actually and uh, and the other side of it is uh, for example cruise ships and ferry operations as well where we are actually very far in in the development so it's a, it's a, it's a huge span and, and we have to focus on on all that volume not just not just you know 
the business where we actually have come far. Uh, it's natural to start there, I think, but it, the, the, the real challenge is to uh, actually be able to to implement these uh, changes that are necessary uh, all over the shipping world, I think. And um, of course, it is it's always a risk if we if we expose ourselves too much uh, that that you can always find part of the of the shipping industry which is uh, is really not very far advanced. So. Um, so, so there are good examples. Those should be put forward, I think. But then, in the background, we need to work with uh, through through the international system we have with the, the entire shipping, so to say. But also, you you see nowadays that the cargo owners have taken interest in working together with the shipping lines mm. because we all want have the same goal. Yeah, we want to have uh, a more sustainable shipping industry. Yeah. Absolutely, I think I think it's uh, it's one uh, step uh, step I think that is being done and. Uh, Corporate uh, social responsibility is uh, I mean, it's, it's increasing all the time and it's a, it, it is a requirement, I think, from people buying stuff from us that it's been taken care of properly uh, from the from the source where it came to to all the way, way to the to the consumer. And then we can show it to the world, because if we don't show what we do or if we don't talk about what we do, who will know? Uh, no, uh, absolutely. So somebody have to take the lead. And that is uh, on us, I think, in this part of the world, uh, definitely. We have the resources to uh, to have research and uh, and development uh, and so on because we have to. The, the difficult part here is that um, nobody can actually make a proper profit and loss calculations on these things. It would never ever work as it is today. I mean, take these chemical fuels for example. They are two times, maybe three times as expensive as a as a regular fuel. But uh, we all know that we can't continue to operate with the with the regular fuel. So. So there have to be incentives in order to to take care of that, and that is of course extremely much more difficult to to do in in certain part of the world where there is a lot of shipping, a lot of dirty shipping, if you like to call it that. But uh, they just can't handle it. So so we have to take the lead, and then it again it'll have to be implemented through the international system. Mm. Uh, the the sulfur regulations now zero point five percent, for example, is a very good example, I think, of where the, where the entire world needs to adjust uh, to. To these things. Yeah, but it also means that if we don't talk about what we do, the regulators do not know what we are what doing and, and how it's achievable, the things that they are setting goals for. Mm. And then at the other end, it's like, if you're not following up who is uh, bending the rules and who is following the rules, nothing will happen there either. It's like, Speeding in a car, you don't. I mean, if no one sees you, you can continue to speed. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Ah, that's true. But here, I, I, I am optimistic here because uh, you know we have digitalization today, and we have uh, we have a huge uh, transparency actually in what we do, and uh, much much more than what we've ever had before. So, in in that respect, and for that particular challenge, I think that that is definitely helping us. That technology, I think. Mm. Did you ever have a role model growing up? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that, actually. I probably did, but... Do you feel like a role model today? Uh, that was a difficult question. <laughs> 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 I, ho- I hope I am for people starting in our industry, that, that it is about um, being very dedicated to your business and to your company and, uh, and like what you do and, and do it well. I, so that's my hope anyway. That, but it would be for others to say... <laughs> I'm sure you are a role model, but but sometimes I stop to think about it because I get told that I'm a role model and I don't really feel that myself either. So it's important sometimes to think about it because you are sending a signal to the young generation. This is a great industry to work in. Yes. And you can have so much fun Mm. doing it and you get to know so many many people. So... That's no, that's that's right, and I mean it, it is definitely a, a fantastic business we are in, and it, it's uh, the technology is, is is definitely extremely challenging and interesting if you're interested in that part. But you also have the business perspective, and you have the international perspective, where you meet so many people, as you say, from different cultures and and countries and so on. So, so in some cases, I I, I can see now people moving around a lot when when they are young from different um, companies and from different industries and so on. Sometimes you really hope that they end up in and i guess this is one way of finding out what they are really interested in and that they ending up there and that they actually do what they are interested in because i think that is um, that is the key to 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 actually be able to 
to do a good job. Mm. Who do you think I should interview the next? <laughs> Who would you be interested in listening to? I think you should in, interview the uh, general secretary of IMO and uh, discuss with him how best the new uh, environmental regulation is being implemented around the globe. Okay. Let's see what I can do about that. <laughs> I know that many people have have asked me to do that. And uh, yeah, why not? Thank you very much, Per, for taking the time to speak to me. Thank you, Per. I think it was very kind of you to both offer IT assistance when I deleted the first file, but when we realized that that was impossible to actually recover the file. You gave me some extra time from your very tight schedule. As I said to you, I'm happy that it was you that I had to go back and confess my shortcomings to and no one else. I know you and I live close to your offices, so it was possible to do it again. It would have been a, an even bigger disaster if I would have deleted an interview with someone who I had met randomly somewhere around the world. Thank you. I have been to London and to Stockholm since the last episode, and I have caught a few interesting interviews for you, which are now in pipeline. I'm planning to go to Noor Shipping, and I am trying to line up even more people for you to listen to. We'll see what happens with that. Oslo, the first week of June. I've also taken the time to sit down and have a look at my audience. And I made a diagram, which you find on the Facebook page of the Shipping Podcast if you're interested. But the short version is that this podcast is now downloaded more than 6,000 times per month in more than 165 countries around the world. The episodes that are most listened to have between 1,500 and 2,000 downloads. But I would say that after 45 days, which is the time range in which we should actually measure, there is a, approximately 1,200 downloads. That is quite a lot, relatively. I mean, we are a niche industry. Not a lot of people are interested in what we do yet. Also, we are a kind of an analog industry. Not a lot of the people in the maritime industry knows about podcasting and even less knows about the shipping podcast. Considering that, I would say that this project has reached success. I would like to give you a little bit more perspective on this project by giving you some statistics. There is currently over 700,000 podcasts on iTunes and 29 million episodes. I mean, what is 111th episode? But if I just give you some more figures about USA, because that is where the industry started by Apple and that is where Edison, which is a company that measures downloads and statistics and so on, I would say that 22% of the U.S. population listens to podcasts weekly. 62 million people. Some more stats is that 50% of the podcasts on iTunes have 130 downloads per month. So 50% of the 700,000 doesn't get much downloads, to be honest. So if you have, if you are a podcaster and have more than 1,100 downloads per episode per month, which this podcast has, I told you, we have approximately 1,200 it's better than 80% of the podcasts on iTunes. Think about that for a while. So I think that I have reached some sort of success. I'm not content. I will continue. But I just wanted you to know, this is my perspective. The audience of the shipping podcast is very loyal. And they are downloading 
as I said, in more than 165 countries around the world, mostly in the maritime hubs. I just wanted to share this with you as I took that moment to celebrate the success. But also to let you know that I'm so grateful for all my listeners. I probably also must mention the interviewees. I'm grateful that my guests make the time to speak to me and to share their knowledge with you and me. Especially if it is like with Per, that he must make it twice. With that, I would have to leave you. So, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 